Have you read um, The Rational Mail? Uh, I've read, yeah, I have read it by Rolo Tomasi, I believe is how you yeah, pronounce his name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We should ch chat sometime. Yeah, I mean, some of these guys, like, he's got some stuff that's rooted in, like, what I would, what I would say is accurate. Yeah. But then it's just taken to an unhealthy level. Yeah, and I'm trying to balance the natural tendencies of man and understand them, but also, do you get what I'm saying? I'm trying not to throw that out. Like, I understand what he's saying, but in the same breath, like, we're also just, we shouldn't, by what, in what area in our lives do we say, well, that's just the natural man, so that's the way it is, and thus it's good, right? It's like, well, that's, well, that's not necessarily good zero thing. Fs mentality that we talk about. Yeah. And that's not, yeah. that's not conduct of a man. Yeah. Like a man, by definition, does not have the zero Fs mentality. Yeah. He is, he is assertive. He is deeply engaged and committed in the things that are important to him, and he isn't dismissive of credible advice, information, resources that may actually serve him. And yeah. I see this whole MGTOW movement. Look, again, a lot of it I think is actually rooted in, in some accuracy about the way men are portrayed in society, the men the way we're viewed. Totally. But then if you take it to an unhealthy level and it causes you to do things that are not in your best interest or the best interest of the, uh, interest of the people you're serving, then that's not, it's not manly conduct. It's the yeah. antithesis of it. Well, and, and, and almost starts having, and it's kind of maybe sounds counterintuitive, but it has a little bit of victimhood to it, right? Like I oh, made that totally. post the other day about fatherhood and immediately was like, oh, but the court systems and, and women and, and you're like, well, hold on. Like it doesn't take away from the fact that you should be doing your job, right? right. Or we do our all best. all of that stuff right? could be true. Yeah. There is, I, I yeah. believe, for example, the court oh, system, sure. I do believe it is stacked against men. And also, I think men should step up to the plate and be personally accountable and responsible for their decisions and actions. Yeah. Both Despite can that. exist. Yeah. Right? We, we fall into this false dichotomy in society where it's like either or. It's like, no, 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 no. Same thing with Black Lives Matter. Like you either support Black Lives Matter or you support the police. It's like I actually fall somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. <laughs> like yeah. I support – the fact that, that black lives actually matter, that's different than the movement Black Lives Matter, by the way. Yeah. And I believe that we should support our first line of defense, which in many cases is our police departments. Yeah. Both can how, exist. How much of that do you think is tied to the natural tendency for us to tribalize? That's exactly that's the right word. It's tribalism. Yeah. It's like yeah. my way or the highway and... I'll My group versus them. Exactly. Right? I'll yeah. give you an example. So in high school, you guys weren't as big a rival as, as we were with, with Beaver because you guys were way yeah. easy to beat. So it wasn't <laughs> a big rival. <laughs> but we had this huge you rivalry. Mentioned, like the school right next to you usually, right? Like course, ours was Richfield right. or North Severe. Yeah. yeah. So we had this huge rivalry with Beaver High School. And – they were dicks and they were assholes and we hated all of those guys. And then I hung out with a couple of them right after high school. And I was like, Oh, these guys are like me. Like they're actually pretty cool. I like them. We get along. We joke. We have some fun together and we chase girls around and we had a good time in college. Right. Yeah. But that's the problem with tribalism is because they were, they lived 30 miles away. We thought they were dicks and assholes and they were the enemy when in all reality they weren't and you know it actually served its purpose because in a high school rivalry the point is to be contentious and to beat each other and to beat up on each other and so it served its purpose but then we mature out of that and realize that oh we aren't enemies we aren't combatants there's nothing that you believe that is at odds with what i believe or threatening to me in any way but this is this requires a level of mature thinking and i don't believe that people are getting exposure to that mature way of viewing the world and mature way of handling themselves. In fact, most people are just like hunched over their cell phone and trying to get back at each other. Clap back is the term, right? Clap back at each other and clap back. That's what I've heard. I don't know if I'm using it in the right context cause I'm not woke, but, <laughs> but that's what they're doing is like, if I can get you, you know, if I can, it's like, this is stupid. This is the way my, my, 
teenager would would act not like a mature man or a mature woman it's absolutely yeah. ridiculous yeah you know i made that response on fate on instagram i told you about earlier i think before we hit record and somebody said you know oh that's a really you know mature response and i'm like it, but the problem is it like it shouldn't be note notable like i was just trying to be respect <laughs> i didn't agree with the one any response should be mature yeah exactly that's what i'm saying like it shouldn't be notable that i responded halfway decent to this woman who disagreed with something that I said, but that, that is, that's a rarity because yeah. we're so worried about like getting them and, and burning them. You know, it's like, it's just, yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous. So. Well, and back to the, the tribalization is like, that's why, you know, you said it yourself. It's effective. It has, it's affected this, you know, we, the order of man, the iron council is a form of, we're a tribe, a tribe. to some extent, sure. right? But, but we need to be educated about what that tribe does and what that tribe supports. And some people jump on the bandwagon of tribe, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, based upon a narrative, right? And, and if we use Black Lives Matter as an example, it's like, that's a statement. Do I agree with that? Sure. I'm part of that tribe. You're like, well, are you? What else does that tribe do? What else does that tribe promote? Do you agree with that? Do you not agree with that? Like, right. we need to be a little bit slower to jump on board with groups and or quote unquote tribes without understanding the full context of what they support and what their motives are as an organization. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying we should do that period. Guys right. should do that when and we talk about make your when decision. they join us in the IC. Yeah. You should have right. done the IC just cause some generic understanding, like look, look us up, listen to the podcast, make sure that these are things that you're aligned with. Well, so there's two things that I think are an issue when it comes to this idea of tribalism. When we, when we aren't willing, like you just said, when we aren't willing to research what's actually happening, you know, like I could slap a sticker on it, but just because I slap a sticker on it doesn't mean that it actually is that thing. You know, I think of yeah. um, like on, you remember the movie Tommy Boy? He's like, I could slap a guaranteed sticker on a box of shit, but it'd still be a box of shit, a guaranteed box of shit or whatever he says, right? Like yeah. that's basically what it is. So if I slap the order of man decal or you slap the submit sticker on there on your hat, like does that actually, what does that actually mean? Like we have to go deeper and take some responsibility for figuring out, okay, what does your hat actually mean? Does that mean like, is that a racist hat? Like submit to white people <laughs> or is that, a, a jujitsu hat. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, but totally. people, but people want to make their own random narratives out of it. So that's a problem. The other yeah. problem is that we base our tribes on immutable characteristics, for example, black and white. And that's an issue because I can't change whether I'm white. Another person can't change whether they're black. That's just melatonin in your skin. Like it is what it is. And if we, I can't change that. I was born in the United States. You can't change that. Maybe you were born in Indonesia or China or Africa or whatever. Like you can't change those things. And if we base it on things that you can't change, we're doing that individual a disservice because we're not honoring them by saying, okay, well, yeah, you were born in, in Indonesia, but you know, let me get to know you. You were born in China, but that doesn't make you a communist. Your actions and your behaviors do. So Define let me you. try to figure yeah. out what it is you're all about. And then I can make my decision because if you're a communist, okay, well, yeah, I adamantly disagree with that. And I think those are not immutable characteristics so that we can actually have a discussion about that. But if I just look at you because your, your skin's a different color or your eyes might be a different shape than mine, that's a stupid thing to be tribal over. It's, it's, it's very immature at best. It's yeah. a, it's a very polite way to put it. Yeah. Hmm. Should we start a podcast? Are we? Do I don't we know. Hit I mean, is this a we already hit record, so I guess we kind of already started. By the way, represent with that be unreasonable oh, shirt. Oh yeah, yeah. Looks it's way similar. better on me than it looks on you, though. It does. Well, it's because the uh, <laughs> more full beard. That, that's what it is. It's the beard and the and the beard. and the black, white, uh, or uh, red, white, and blue uh, style order man hat there. I didn't know I you believe, had that color man. variation. That's you good. didn't. Uh -uh. I send you a hat, dude. Yeah, I, I got the, I got you. the, I got the orange and the blue. The, oh, like. the, uh, the scout hat. I'll get you one of these. I'll shoot you one over this afternoon, right, uh, tomorrow cool. when we do our orders. All right. You guys heard him.
<laughs> well, I didn't say it was free. I'm going to expect payment. <laughs> you all text me. You're like, uh, still waiting for payment. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. I'll just send you an invoice. It's cool. You're good for it. <laughs> just build my card. That's right. Yeah, that's true. I got your card on file, man. <laughs> yeah, you're like, hey, I'll send you. Hey, you want a bunch of these? I'll send you a bunch. Yeah. You and then just you have to charge me. Up. <laughs> Could you imagine? That'd be so awesome. What are you drinking there, Kip? You got some Red Bull? Yeah. I got uh, Origin Discipline today. Believe it or not, that's water. an origin bottle. It's water. <laughs> uh, I love that All joke. Right. Do you tell that to Pete and Brian yet? No, that, I uh, need to. I need to. This place should just to, be like. Just start canning water. And somebody messages water. me, hey, this just tastes like water. Yeah, yeah have bro, discipline. Like, discipline. <laughs> like drink some water. Uh, you don't need pre-workout. That's, that's, right. called, that's called motivation. That's right. Uh, <laughs> All right. All right. Let's get into it, man. Yeah, so we're filling these questions today from our Facebook group. To join us there, go to facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Our first question, Tony Ching, as a single father raising 14 and a 15-year-old girls, and when they want a boyfriend, what's the best approach that would be cool to know? Thank you. Cool to know. <laughs> cool to know. Yeah. I don't know if that's cool, man. Um, yeah. I was just talking with my daughter. She's six, and... I'm nervous. I'm really nervous. And I still got a few years before I have to get into that. Look, I think, I think you just be realistic, right? Like it's good that she's attracted to boys. It's good that she wants a boyfriend. You know, as dads were like, Oh, this sucks. This is stupid. No, this is healthy. That's the, that's the perspective we need to realize. This is a healthy thing. It's not unhealthy. Don't make it. She's interested. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's a good thing. So I would say, at the root level, you know, make sure she's comparing him to you. And that's a good comparison, right? So when she goes out with a boy, she's like, okay. And maybe she's doing this subconsciously, but she's still doing it. She's, she's measuring him against you. And, and if he falls short of that, I think it's less likely unless you're a, well, and then she would fall short. I'll just say it this way. If, if, if he falls short of that, then that will not look favorably upon him. Right. Yeah. That's the point. Like, I want to be the highest possible standard for my daughter and, and for my sons when they think about how they want to show up as husbands and fathers and everything else. But for my daughter, I want to be an example and I want to be the metric by which she judges her future decisions off, as, off of as well, including the boys, the young men, and the men that she decides to eventually to partner with. So set that bar extremely high. And then teach her. You know, t teach her, teach her to take care of herself, teach her to be responsible, teach her about, and, and I would say include your wife in this process, of course, but teach her about sex and unwanted pregnancy and disease and the attachment that comes with premarital sex. Like that stuff sucks, but man, you want to talk about that stuff. One thing you've talked about quite a bit is like, how do you defend yourself? That's something that I've actually been very aware of. You know, my, my wife and, and hasn't, hasn't been exposed like to the deep end of, of like violent sexual activity but like guys boys try to take advantage of her you know i don't think this is all yeah. this is all that uncommon which is unfortunate it's tragic and that's part of what this this mission of order of man is all about to make sure that we're upstanding capable men with character um but it's likely that at some point my daughter will will be exposed to some unwanted advances and so i whatever side of the spectrum that is. And so I need to make sure that she's capable mentally, physically of being able to defend herself against those things. So, you know, there's so many variables and components of, of this equation, but again, it's making yourself an example. Um, it's having the conversations with your daughter, including your wife that need to be had. And then it's making herself capable of standing up and defending herself in situations, uh, that she compromising situations that she may find herself in. Yeah. And I think there's going to be uniqueness based upon the personality of your daughter. You know, like I, I think of my oldest, my oldest daughter's a, she's very appeasing. And so mm. a conversation I'm going to have with her is like, Hey, just because a boy wants to kiss you, you need to want to do that. Right. Like, yes. Cause I could totally see her being like, well, he, he wanted to kiss me. So I kiss, you know what I mean? It's like, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. Like this is, you know, you right. need to be sure. Don't appease. You have a or, say in that. Yeah, that you have a say in the matter. And I'm not going to have to worry about that with my other daughter because she'll just like, you know, 
punch the kid Slap in the face him or punch something. Him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, yeah. Exactly so there's right. going to be some adjustments for your, for based upon personality types for sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, th- I think having daughters is definitely harder than having sons, you know, so I can appreciate your concern. I can definitely appreciate your concern, but yeah. you know, you're at a good age to be able to teach them and to be able to make them aware of what's going on. The other thing that I didn't mention here is this is something that I think is often overlooked with fathers is that that boy, it might just be a fling. In fact, it probably is at 14 and 15 years old. It's probably just a fling, Yeah. but your daughter is going to start dating men, young men and men who could potentially become a lifelong partner, which makes you their father. Yes. Father-in-law, but it also makes you their father. So if it were me and when I get to this situation, I plan on fathering that young man, even if it's a 14, 15, 16 year old fling and she's got a little summer crush on some boy like, Hey, you, you, yeah, you can hang out with my daughter with us. You know, like, yeah. come on. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to treat him like a jerk and I'm not going to make him feel stupid and I'm not going to embarrass him. Why would I do that? Like, I'm actually going to take him under my wing and help, and help him, him understand what it means to be a man. That boy could potentially be my son at some point. And if not, he's going to be somebody's son. Like what an opportunity I have to maybe provide him with some fathering that he may not have gotten already. Uh, but you know, if, if my daughter is deciding to give her heart to him, like I might have some influence over this young man and that would be a pretty good thing for not only him, but also for my daughter, which is my responsibility. So that is something a lot of guys overlook. Like I'm going to, I'm going to grill him and I'm going to bring the guns and look, I've been guilty of talking about that kind of stuff too. I do it tongue in cheek, but ultimately like I, I'm going to try to step into some sort of fatherly role, even with a young man that potentially wants to date my daughter. Which is only going to increase the chances of him making better decisions with your daughter. So, Or running off if he's too intimidated yeah. by the fact that I have a good relationship with my daughter and I have a vested interest in him, which isn't a bad thing either, right? Yeah. If he's willing to run in that situation, good. By all means, let's scare that out of him or whatever, you know? So, Totally. All right, Tyler Gilson. As I prepare for my first child in the coming days, what are some of the best ways to support my fiance and make life a little easier on her? What do you both do in order to help your wives with your children when they were first born? Here's one thing I would look, you're going to get a lot of advice, but one thing I would be careful of is saying the phrase, what can I do to help? Yeah. Like, don't say that because here's why you're being lazy and I'm guilty of this. Hey hon, what can I do to help? And we think we're being helpful, but yeah. you're not. What you're trying to do is you're trying to put the responsibility back on her so she can like line you out and tell you what you need to do and lead you. You're a leader. You're a man, right? And you want to be a patriarch of your family. So lead. Leaders recognize what needs to be done and they figure out a way to make it happen. Maybe that's taking it upon themselves. Maybe it's a level of delegation, but somehow they make that thing happen. And leaders don't need to be told what to do. Leaders look for problems. They look for opportunities. And then without permission, they step into those things and create the solutions to the problems they see. So with your wife, when you notice that she's having a difficult time mentally, don't ask her what you can do. Just go do the damn dishes. Yeah. Right? Or if you have other kids in my situation, if you have other kids, when my wife was pregnant with our second, third, and fourth, Like, I don't need to ask her what to do. I just need to get the first two out of her hair for a few hours. And so it's very simply me coming to her and saying, Hey, hon, you know, I I, I know you're stressed out a little bit right now and maybe you're not feeling that great. So I just want to give you a couple hours this afternoon. Uh, Me and the boys are going to go to the batting cages and we're just going to take some batting practice for a couple hours. So, you know, read a book, work on your garden, relax, watch a show, whatever, but we'll be back at five period, the end. Like you, if you, if you want to lead, then lead. And a follower says, what can I do? A leader says, that's what I need to do. And then goes and does it. Cool. Ryan, uh, Gustafson, Gustafson, my son will be four in August within the last month or so. He is becoming extremely disrespectful, tries to hurt us and will won't go to bed without a fight. Most nights. Dang, man. That's cool. Sorry. I'm like, <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm it's like it's a it's just a diff my four year old is very much the same. If he gets mad, he literally says, Do you want me to cut you? I'm like, whoa <laughs> dude. 
That's what hilarious. is your problem? Or if he gets mad, he goes straight to scratching. It isn't like scratch. Like he like grabs you and just like hard hook. fish hooks you. Yeah. Yeah. Fish hook. Like, yeah. Dude, what is your problem? Yeah. He did have some post questions, right? Did your kids go through this phase? What did you do? And yes. what are some ideas to get your son to listen? Uh, and, and, and do what he, what you ask of him. Sorry. So I found that making, so with a stubborn child, one that's full of piss and vinegar, like my four-year-old is, and it sounds like your four-year-old is, that's actually a good thing, by the way. Like, it's not bad. Just I think harder. Yeah. It's harder because he's not subservient. Like my older, my old, you can look at him the right way. And he's like, I'm sorry. My youngest is like, why are you looking at me like that? And then we'll walk up and punch you, you know, because you're looking at him like that. Or foot stomp on you. Yeah. Foot stomp. Yes. Foot stomp my toes, which he did. For those of you who don't know, my son, my four-year-old came up to me the other day. He's like, hey, dad, guess what? And I looked down at him. I'm like, what? And he just heel stomped the shit out of my toes. I had bare feet. And he just heel stomped. And then he just ran away. And I was pissed. But also, I thought it was really funny at the same time. <laughs> no, I know. I know what this is about, Kip. You've probably got a child or children that fit this yeah. mold, right? Yeah. And it's good because they're independent, they're resilient, they're, they're strong-willed, and all of that stuff is good. So understanding that and knowing that and appreciating that, that's part of it. Just appreciating that, okay, well, this kid is stubborn. What I try to do for, as best I can for a four-year-old is try to make the things that I want him to do his own idea, if I can make going to bed his own idea, if I can make cleaning up his own idea, or if I can make those type of things fun where he's like, I actually want to do this, then I have more, uh, I just have more opportunity. It just works better when I do it that way. Um, disciplining is about finding what your children don't like and then, and then exposing them to that or taking away the things that they do like. My four-year-old is very social. So in disciplining, look, I, I don't spank, okay? But if I did, I bet I could spank him till I was blue in the face and he would just look at me and be like, is that all you got? Yeah. So with him, that's not what it's about because he's defiant by nature, right? So he's like, bring it on. Like, go ahead and spank me. Again, I don't spank, but if I did, that's, I think, what the situation would be. But if I if I tell him to go sit on the stairs by himself, he's pissed. He hates it. So that's his point, right? It's like, okay, he doesn't want to be isolated. He doesn't want to be alone. He wants to be around him with other people. So I know what that is and I can discipline in that matter. And I can threaten that matter too. Hey, if you can't behave at the dinner table and eat your food and contribute to the conversation, then you get to go sit on the stairs by yourself and you're not going to participate in this. Toes the line. So you got to find what he likes, what he's interested in. Um, he or she, I don't know if they said a boy or girl, but, and, and then find son. the things that son. Okay. Uh, and then strip that away. That's, that's the consequence of that behavior. Give him an opportunity and a warning. Hey, look, if you don't do this, here's the consequence. Okay. They did it. Consequence. And you start to mirror those consequences and they learn pretty quickly when you find that pain point for them. Yeah. I, I, the only things I would add is unemotional consequence, I think is, is valuable, mm -hmm. but it's like, Hey, sorry, bud, but this is what our agreement was, right. yeah, this but is it's not an angry. Right. Yep. And then the other thing to, to give some example to like putting them in charge, you know, we've done this with my youngest daughter where it's like, uh, you're in charge today. Like we've given her a day of when she's in charge mm. and then we're like, okay, we need to do these things. So what do you want to do? You know? Or say, okay, today's your, your turn to be in charge of bedtime. So what, you know, you have this window, what do you want to do first? Do you want to watch a movie? Do you want to brush our teeth first and then watch a short show? Or do you want to read a book? Like, and just get, empower them. And they, awesome. they, I like that. she eats it up. Like she'll tell everybody all day long, right? right see a stranger at the grocery store. I'm in charge <laughs> today, you know? Uh, so yeah, I, I would just let them. Let them run with it and kind That's of cool. suck it up a yeah. little bit and let them feel the the power of being in charge because they think it's so special, you know, when, because well, what, just if you think about it, it's honing it, right? Yeah. And it's a power play a little bit. Like a lot of, if you think about it, it's like that defiance is they don't want 
you to tell them what to do. They want to be in charge. I mean, it's right. a little bit of a, like, it is, I'm course. my own person. So well, then let them give them the, like you said, give them the, uh, the framework. This is what we got to do. And we got to be in bed maybe by this time, but until now and then you decide what that looks like. You know? Well, and you think about what your role, I love that idea because if you think about what your role, and we've talked about this at length, your role as a parent is to render yourself obsolete. We've talked about that. It's to put yourself out of work as a father. Yeah. So does disciplining your children and keeping them under your thumb do that? No. I don't think so. Unless you're explaining lessons all. that go behind it. But if yeah. you give your child just a little bit of leash, right? Just a little bit. You don't want to put them in situations where it's dangerous or destructive or has consequences that they can't recover from. But just a little bit of leash to say, okay. Like, why wouldn't you look at that and think that's a good thing? Like my, my daughter or my son is strong-willed and independent and they want to do things on their own. They want to make their own decisions. I'm like, cool. That's going to make my job a whole lot easier because I actually want you at some point to start making your own decisions. And you have a child potentially who is ready to do that sooner than your other children. That's yeah. going to be way easier in a lot of ways. If yeah. you allow him or her to develop that, to hone that skill and that desire, yeah. uh, it doesn't make it easy necessarily. It just means, okay, well, this little one is already moving in that direction. Great. Here's how we're going to foster that. Yeah. And our natural tendency is to crush that spirit. And spirit right. Why would we do that? Easier. Yeah. Why, yeah, exactly. Because it's yeah. disrespectful. They're disrespecting. It has nothing to do with you. It has yeah. nothing to do with you. Because they'll disrespect yeah. every stranger on the street just the same as they'll do you. So it's not personal. It's yeah. just their personality. Mm. And that's, um, that's, I think that's really powerful what you just said, because I think that could even, even be applied to, to uh, teenagers lashing out, right? We have a tendency oh, as sure. parents is like, oh, they're, they're being disrespectful. They don't love us. And they may even say things like, we, I don't love you. Right. Oh, I hate you. But right? yeah, I hate you. You're the worst ever, but uh, that's all still tied to the same exact concept. I mean, they're going to treat a stranger on the street the same exact way. Yep. And we better say too, I don't think we said this. These are follow-up questions from last week because we did one dedicated specifically to fathers for Father's Day. So this is a follow-up on those questions. That's why all of these questions are pertaining to fatherhood. <laughs> yeah, so. a little bit of a theme going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, John O. Alphabet. Uh, hi, Kip and Ryan. Hugely enjoy your shows uh, around fatherhood. I'm a new father and to be honest, although I love my wife and kid, I find that I have no time or energy for things that used to make me, me such as football, working out, and et cetera. How do you balance the fight for self-care with the responsibilities of your kid and family without seemingly seeming neglectful or selfish? Many things. Well, look, you're using the word fight, and that's the problem because there's contention between you and your wife or, or some level of perceived contention. Maybe yeah. she is, maybe she actually wants you to, and you just are perceiving it and you're that just she doesn't want paranoid you to. about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is likely, and, and could very, very, very uh, really be like, be a possibility. Like, because you feel guilty, right? you want to be around, and I actually commend you for that. Like the fact that you want to be around, that you feel guilty for taking care of yourself, means that you want to do right. That's a good thing. You're just not handling it correctly. So you need to actually talk with her first and make sure that your assumptions are her reality. They may not be. You may be filling in all these little gaps about her philosophy and her way of thinking that aren't actually what she's thinking. And you owe that to her. And frankly, she owes it to you to have candid discussions about your role as a father and how you can continue to take care of yourself. And if you continue to look at this as this contentious, bitter thing like me versus her, then of course you're going to create some animosity and there's going to be some, some problems there. Instead of looking at it like that, reframe it and think that if I go take care of myself, I'm actually going to come back and I'm going to be a more engaged, more capable, more grounded husband and father. Because now you're giving yourself permission to go do that thing. But second part of this, you actually have to come back and be a better father and be a better husband. This goes back to the boundaries that we've been talking about for five years. When you say you're going to be present for them and with them, you need to get off your phone. You need to get off your, all, all your other distractions. You need to be present, engaged for and with them because you said you would. 
And when you become a man of your word on that side of things, when you tell your wife, hey, hon, uh, do you mind if I go to jujitsu tonight? She's actually going to want you to. Because she's going to appreciate that when you come back, you're more engaged, you're more connected, you're, you're happier, you're easy to be around, you're more patient. A lot of things that happen for me when I go to jujitsu. And so when I say, in fact, the other, the other day I said, I don't want to go to jujitsu jiu tonight. My wife's like, no, you're going to jujitsu tonight. <laughs> like that's, that's the level you want to get to. She wants you to go take care of yourself. And then you go do it and you honor that commitment and, and things are good. So um, the other thing I would say is, like when I ask my wife, hey, hon, do you mind if I go to jujitsu tonight? I'm actually not asking for permission. I'm just politely telling her that that's what I'm going to do and trying to find out if there's any conflict with that. Because if there is, if she said, oh, no, actually tonight I was planning on going with my girlfriends. We've had a plan for three weeks. Or, um, you know, I'm really not feeling good tonight. Like I'm sick. And so could you take care of the kids? Oh, I can honor that. I can respect that. But I'm not asking for permission. I'm politely suggesting that this is what I'm going to go do. And we know that about each other. And we honor that. And we honor those commitments outside of our commitments to each other through years and years of practice and conversation. Uh, and, and when she says, hey, hon, do you mind if I go? For example, the other night she came to me and she said, hey, um, I'm thinking about doing some master classes online. Are you familiar with these things? It's pretty yeah, cool. Master they classes. sound yeah. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So she's like, hey, on, on Wednesday night, I'm thinking about just doing master class. So I know you go to jujitsu. I'll put the kids down while you're at class. And then when you get home, I'll probably just already be in a master class. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah, that's great. So now she does on Wednesday nights. Like we're not like together necessarily. She's in that room. I'm over here. I might play the guitar or do something that's engaging for me. She's doing her master class. But we talk about it openly. And then when we're done, we reconvene and life is good. All is good. So you need to have those conversations. You need to be open. You need to be respectful. You're not asking for permission, but you do need to come back a more engaged husband and father than you potentially were before. Did I lose you on internet? Cool. All right. Uh, Dominic Bright, do you use your own planner or a planner at all on a daily basis? Maybe I should have skipped this question. Sorry. I use this planner right here. <laughs> it sits right by me at all times. This is the power Come planner. Come on, yeah, Dominic. You should have known this already. Come on, man. Um, if you go to the store, they're on back order right now, but you can order them. Store.orderaman.com. But this is the planner I use. And when you purchase the planner, there's a link in there with an accompanying video that explains and walks through how to use it. Yeah. The already other thing on I will say. Order, huh? That didn't last long. No, I had like 400 of them and they sold within like a few days, several days. Uh, cool. The other thing I'll make you guys aware of, this is very, very close. In fact, after Kip, you and I get done recording this podcast, I have a conversation with uh, a friend of mine, George Bryant, who's helping me work through some of this stuff. But there is a course called 30 Days to Battle Ready, which is actually going to walk you through in depth and in detail the plan that I use not necessarily the planner itself, but the philosophy behind the plan and how you can incorporate it in your own life using whatever tools you have at your disposal and or the things that we have at our disposal. So if you go to, uh, I don't even think I have the link yet, but if you go to, you can go to our website and just sign up for emails and then when it becomes available, you'll get, you'll get the notice. Cool. All right, Greg uh, Wanberg. Can you give examples on different components of rites of passage for our kids? I've got a few ideas uh, that I'm working on, leadership, self-awareness, but you mentioned other facets a few weeks ago, and I'd like to learn. Cheers. Yeah, so one thing I do with my kids is we do a rite of passage uh, at, when they turn eight every two years. So that'll give them five opportunities by the time they're 18 and they're out on their own and going to college or pursuing their careers. Um, in addition to everything we're doing on a daily basis. But, you know, I, I think at its fundamental level, when you're talking about a rite of passage for your child, it needs to have purpose. Like we're not just going on a camp out to have fun. It's not what it's about. Yeah. The, the purpose of this is to go through some challenges, some obstacles, to have some discussions, and then you're going to come on the other side of this thing more prepared to be the man that you ultimately want to become. So there's there's purpose. There's a clearly defined message that's important. 
I would also say get them involved. That's a critical component. If you're just doing everything, then they're just showing up. You're really missing an opportunity to get them involved in the leadership process and the organization of it. So that might be planning out what they want to do. A gentleman and a friend of mine by the name of Jim Shields has a book called Family Board Meeting, and I've extracted some of his philosophies and points in letting your children dictate what that quote unquote board meeting should be. It's a play on words for surfboard because they're a surf family. So he calls it a family board meeting. That's they, they go out and they surf or do whatever it is that their children want to do. It's a really good book and it's a quick read. It's called family board meeting by Jim Shields. Um, there has to be an element of challenge. If it's not difficult or challenging or test them in some way, then it's probably not a rite of passage. It's just a weekend vacation or a getaway. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. That's good. That's fine. Yeah. But if you're looking at creating a rite of passage, there has to be challenge. And you, it's up to you as their father to determine what the line is where they'll bend a little bit, but they'll push through versus breaking. Because the idea is you want them to pass the rite of passage. So you need to find the line of bending and being strained and stressed, but still being able to complete the task at hand versus breaking, faltering, and not completing what it is you want them to accomplish. And it gets progressively more difficult as they get older, right? Uh, You've got to be just you and him. Can't have mom around. Can't have sisters around. It's specific to you and and him or or even her actually but mom shouldn't be around i love mom to death but mom will coddle mom will nurture and she'll baby because that's what she does like you look at when we talk about what it means to be a man protect provide preside a lot of people say well what's the equivalent for a woman it's to nurture uh it's to support it's to foster all of those things are wonderful in the right context But when you're trying to push your child further than they've gone before, nurturing, supporting, that kind of stuff, that isn't necessary. In fact, it might be a hindrance to what it is you're trying to to do. So you have to get them away from mom so you can go do the thing. And then there has to be learning, right? There's going to be some uncomfortable and awkward conversations with your children about something, whether it's sex or, or pornography or drugs or politics or God or whatever it is that you feel like you want to discuss there has to be some element of dynamic learning in there where they understand, okay, like, yeah, this is new information I've never heard before in a way I haven't heard it before. So I think if you look at challenges, you look at learning, you look at separation from their mom, and then you look at getting them involved, I think you're going to have and build a pretty cool rite of passage for your child. Cool. All right. Um, I lost my spot. Jeez. Skyler uh, Byrne. Amateur. What it, Amateur. I know. What improvements would you like to see on social media platforms that would facilitate content creators like yourself increased uh, monetization? Interesting question. I haven't, yeah, it is an interesting question. I actually haven't given it much thought because I think what's available now is actually pretty powerful. You know, I like we, I, I know we like to gripe about Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all oh, these things suck. And I wouldn't have a job if it weren't for social media. So, yeah. I mean, I think there's improvements that can be made, but I'm actually pretty grateful that these platforms are available. Uh, I, yeah. I actually, I don't, one thing I don't like is that they're selective and increasingly so in causes and things that they believe they should be supportive about like i I don't i don't think that's social media's role and responsibility i think the role of a social media provider is to provide an open platform that allows people to dictate how they use it and to find what's important like i don't think i don't think facebook should be making COVID 19 suggestions for me or black lives matter suggestions for me I, i just think it should be And look, I don't mind if it's making recommendations based on what I like and what I'm, but I I don't think it should be selective in what it's choosing. I don't, I also don't think it should be selective in, okay, we're going to sponsor this political ad, but not that political ad. Like that's where it becomes a problem is when it's selective. And it's, this is the whole pro look, this is actually the issue with what a lot of people are saying right now is that, is that there isn't an equitable representation across the, the country, whether it's your, your ethnicity, your color of your skin, there isn't 
an equitable distribution of that. And, and yet we support Facebook and Twitter and Instagram with an inequitable distribution based on like whatever the powers that be at Facebook decide is important. That, that to me isn't leveling the playing field. That's stacking the deck. And just because it happens to be stacked in favor of a cause you like or dislike, like that shouldn't be the issue. The issue should be at its fundamental level of stacking the deck. I have to be supportive, for example, of causes I don't appreciate if I hope to or have any desire of being in integrity for them supporting causes I believe in. That's one of the hardest things. I think people have a very difficult time overcoming. They'll support, they'll support a, a, a stance when it's in alignment with their own views, yeah. but they won't support it when it's in, not in alignment with their views. And that is a problem. That's a huge problem. Yeah. That's not leveling the playing field. Again, that's stacking the deck. And that's, isn't that like kind of what people are upset about right now? Is that there isn't a level playing field? Yeah. So it's crazy. So crazy. Well, you, you see that, um, not to roll in social media stuff, but do you see that post where I can't remember who made the post, but it was a, it was an ad and that it depicted a person cutting the throat of a cop. Oh, and, really? yeah. And someone reported it as inappropriate and yeah, it and is inappropriate. Yeah. And Facebook's response was like, this doesn't meet our regulations. And they, they didn't take it down. That's crazy. Threat of violence yeah. doesn't reach yeah. your, what? and like meet your guidelines. Yeah. And there's like a knife in the, in the throat and the person's bleeding. Yeah. And then you, and then you look at some of the stuff that they are blocking. You're like, th those two things are not even like on the same playing field at all. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to give them the, like necessarily the benefit of the doubt here, but like, I had a post on Instagram. This was probably six months or a year ago. And it was a, it was a up close picture of me with my, my release from my bow and I was shooting, but it was just my release. Like it was just like right there. So it's just yeah. my release and they had marked it as sensitive content. I'm like, what? Like, it's just my face. I know, like, my face isn't as attractive as maybe you would like it to be. But it's <laughs> literally, issue, like, yeah. it's my face. Like, I can't change my I try to cover it up with my beard, and I can only do so much. It's my face. Like, I'm not sure why this is sensitive. And so giving social media the benefit of the doubt, you know, somebody probably reported it because they didn't like me or they didn't like hunting. So they're like, well, that's report, report that. And these social media platforms are using algorithms or, or, or having people follow guidelines that doesn't provide for any context or nuance. And that's actually one of the biggest problems with social media yeah. by design. Like there's no ability to provide any context. I made a post on Twitter months ago about, you know, just some things that I had accomplished. I think we talked about this, some things yeah. like I was proud of that I had accomplished yeah. and looking back on it now, I'm like, Oh yeah, I could see how that might come across as arrogant but like surely not to the degree of like retribution that I receive for making that post. But again, giving the benefit of the doubt, there's no context there. I, I actually believe in order to be successful on Twitter, you have to be a bit of a pessimist to, towards society anyways, but that's a whole other conversation. But there's no context and nuance allowed in these social media platforms. And that's why podcasting is so valuable. That's why face-to-face -face meetings are so valuable and why... Yeah tweets and texts and even email are less valuable than you and me sitting across face to face. Like this is better than a text, what we're doing right now. And if we were doing this face to face, it would be even better than what we're doing here. Yeah. So there's degrees of communication and this is superior to text, but inferior to face to face and social media is at the, like the lower, the lower end of that, uh, that totem pole, if you will. Yeah. The effectiveness of a soundbite, right? Yeah. And it's that's crazy. the point, right? Again, yeah. that's like the clap back thing I was talking about, right? Like if I can get you in a quick soundbite, I've got you. Your number is mine. Yeah. Yep. And it requires minimal brain cycles for someone to consume and, and come up with their own opinion and judgment and they don't have to right. give much thought to it. Right. right. That's the idea. Yeah.
All right, Chad, Nigel, uh, I only have partial custody of my nine-year-old son every other weekend during the year and every other week during the summer. I feel his mom. Uh, I feel his mom babies and coddles him way too much. What are some tips and tactics that I can employ to to counteract this in a short amount of time that I have him? Mm. Well, I think you're probably already doing it when you're with him, right? Which is to give him responsibility, have some level of accountability built in, have consequences for your choices. Like all of those things I probably think you're doing. What I think you might potentially be overlooking here is that there may be a way to make her an ally in this. Because she wants what's best for him too. And I don't know, like I know there's women who are vengeful. I know there's women who, yeah. I, I know that's there. I'm not dismissing that. I'm just saying like maybe there's an opportunity to not poke at her and say, well, you're not, you're not, you're coddling him and you're overprotective and you're doing this and you're doing this and instead enlist her by explaining what you think he needs and then asking her in what way do you think he could get that from me? This goes back to the stubborn four-year-old, by the way. And I'm not saying by default, all women are stubborn. I'm not saying that. Better throw that disclaimer because somebody's going to get pissed. They're going to hear that and say, oh, I can't believe you say that. Oh. <laughs> I'm just saying this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that, that strong-willed four-year-old. Make it their idea. So you go to your wife, your ex-wife, or, or the, the mother of your, your baby, and you say, hey, you know, um, when, when little Johnny's with me, I really want to make sure he's, he's getting what he needs from me as his father which is different than what he might need from you. And you do a wonderful job as his mother and providing him all of that. I just think there might be a difference in the way that we approach this. And I'm wondering just because he's with you more often, what you think I could do to be able to provide him with the fatherly direction and guidance and structure that he may need that, um, that maybe isn't being provided because you know, I'm not in the house. Are there some things that I can do that you see? Make it her idea. Now she's like, well, he just, he really needs discipline. <laughs> she might actually come to you and say that. Yeah. Like she might actually, if you ask, she might actually recognize her own shortcomings. My, my mom did, which is why she got me involved in, in Boy Scouts and competitive sports because she knew she couldn't provide that fully to me. She knew that it would take another man to do that. And so she made, she was adamant about me being involved in competitive sports and I'm so grateful to her that she was willing to make, to, to recognize that and then to make that decision. And I would think that this, the, this woman might actually feel the same way if you can enlist her in the cause as opposed to position her as the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I like that because she should maybe coddle him a little bit, right? You that's mean, her, that's her job. That's Nurture. her job. Yeah. Support. So, Love. Yeah. That's her job. Let her nurture. And I think the negative, I don't know, I might be wrong here. Maybe let me know what you think about this idea, Ryan. But I think that a lot of the discipline and, you know, him coming into this, uh, into this approach to provide some, uh, I don't know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting for the words here, but he wants to create some discipline and, and have his son be a little bit tougher. Some of, some of that, as you create that for him, the coddling will naturally become less attractive to him, right? He, yeah, he'll that's true. That's he'll then point. show up at mom's and go, hey, mom, mom, I, I don't, you know, like I'm getting some self-confidence, right? And I can do this myself. And, and he's going to naturally not want to get coddled as he builds confidence with you. And, and I think that's what you're, what we're trying to, or at least I would suggest that you're trying to do when he's with you. It's not just like put him through the ringer. You're trying to build self-confidence. So he mm. feels confident that he can do something on his own. And that's the power of what, of what you're saying, Ryan, of give him some control, give him some reins, let him learn that I can do this on my own, whatever, whatever that is, whether it's mowing the lawn or putting himself to bed or, or whatever, you find out how do you build that confidence. So then that way he doesn't need as much coddling anymore because he believes he can point. do it himself. Yeah, that's a good point. John Eldridge kind of touches on this point in his book, Wild at Heart. 
and I can't remember the exact verbiage, but it's something to the effect of, you know, women are answering, are, are attempting in their life to answer the question, am I lovely? Hmm. Like, am I worthy of being loved, essentially? Okay. Yeah. Men, on the other hand, are constantly asking the question, am I capable? Can I do this all on my own? And the closer that women move towards the answer to their question and the closer that men move towards the answer to their question, the more confidence to your point that they're going to develop and they're going to reject. This is why a lot of guys will have eventually mommy issues, right? Or they'll hear their mom say, oh, honey, it's okay. Oh, sweetheart, it's okay. Because that's not capability, right? Like the mom's trying to get them to love them because they're trying to answer the question, am I lovely? Am I lovable? And, and the, the boy's man like, is that's like, that's not what I want. Yeah. No, am I capable? And being tied to you doesn't help me be capable. So yeah. then what ends up happening in, in an unhealthy situation, there's a lot of resentment and animosity between a son and his mother. And what a father does is a father bridges the gap or kind of separates that tie a little bit from mom. So it, it allows a mother to focus on the husband so that the son can eventually separate and go out and build his own kingdom. But if the dad's not there, that separation rarely happens unless the mom is emotionally aware enough to say, in some ways I might be hindering my son. And so I need to let him go because him answering his question is more important than me getting an answer to my question. That would be a very loving gesture. And so I need to let him go and get him involved around other men who can help him answer his question, which again is more important than yeah. the woman answering hers, the mom answering her question. Well, and I would assume that in some cases that mom assumes that, that his question is the same as hers. It's, and that's of course. a major issue, right? Because we assume all like, oh, he's trying to answer the same question I'm trying to answer. And honey, I do love you and you are great, you know, and it'll be okay and you are right. lovable. And it's like, that's not even his question. <laughs> that's not even what he's looking for. Right. You're providing solutions to problems he doesn't have. Yeah. Like he's not worried about, do you love me? And even with fathers, like, a son isn't interested in, does my father love me? They'll say that, like, oh, I never was connected. I don't know if my father loved That's not the question. The question is, did he approve of you? And, and approval that, means capability. Yeah. I approve yeah. of you. Like, if I'm approving of my son, for example, because he's capable and proficient at a thing. And so men aren't interested in the love of their father. They're interested in the approval of their father, which ties into capability, not being lovely. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of guys, what that another word that I think we use sometimes, or at least I do, is that's respect. Mm, sure. Yeah. Approve of me means he respects me. Sure. As a, as a man, capable. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Let's take a couple more, Kip. All right. Uh, Stephen uh, Drummond, uh, with the way this group and movement has taken off, have y'all thought about making chapters based on regional locations to have more focused discussions and get togethers with those around us to help each other grow? Yeah, I mean, we have. I've do, we've done a lot of that in, inside the Iron Council. Um, a lot of that is happening just because, in fact, I saw a post of yours, Kip, the other day where you had posted, it's been a couple of years, but you were your Echo Guys, right? I think is what it yeah. was. And yep. so that is happening within the Iron Council. These guys are having meetups and connecting and going on adventures and doing some very cool stuff together. Uh, we've talked about it for a long time, and it's something that's still on my radar, although it's on the edges, the outskirts of my radar, which is recent regional order of men chapters. The reason I haven't up to this point is just because I'm not willing to invest that much time and energy into creating something like that because that would detract from the other priorities that I have made important in my life. And, and I'm using that language very intentionally. I could definitely do it, but I have chosen not to currently right now because I have other things that are more important to me. And I've said that to people and something like, well, you know, you really have an obligation. I don't have an obligation to anybody that I haven't made an obligation to. Yeah. So 
So if you think I have an obligation to you because I started this movement, then you've got another thing coming. And I don't think this guy's asking that question or even alluding to that. So I just want to be clear on that. But look, that might happen down the road, but there's nothing to stop you from doing it now. I know that there's men who are meeting on a weekly basis and they will, they're, they've purchased a copy of sovereignty for each one of them. They're reading the book. They're going through it on a week by week basis and they're listening to the podcast and they are getting together and having discussions about what it is we're talking about. There's nothing to keep you from doing that. Oh, well, Ryan, you have the, inf- you have this, you have the infrastructure. That's an excuse. You can do it. Just do it. Hey, this, this weekend, we're going to meet at IHOP or whatever. And we're going to have this, or we're going to meet after this church sermon, or we're going to meet at the community center on Tuesday at six o'clock, or we're going to have a pickup game of basketball every morning at 5 a.m., whatever, whatever it looks like to you. And then post it in the Facebook group. Hey guys, anybody in the Dallas area, anybody in the Portland area, anybody in the wherever, wherever you are, Salt Lake area, here's what we're doing. Love to have you come and be consistent, have a plan and make it happen. You can do it. And you have my blessing and permission to do it. There you go. Okay. Andrew uh, Leonard's my oldest five is highly competitive. Everything is a competition. Who can dress faster? Who can get down the stairs faster? But he does. But he isn't first. He does not handle it well. When he's not first, he doesn't handle it well. Mm-hmm. How do I teach him to use that competitive nature to his advantage while also teaching him how to lose gracefully and use that to get better the next time? He's five? Yeah. It's tough with a five-year-old because you can't really have those like emotionally intelligent discussions about, hey, look, don't get upset when you lose. Like, Use it as fuel to get better, right? So, okay, yeah. you lost that thing. What three things can you implement now to make you better next time? At, maybe at five, you could probably have that to yeah. some degree. Like, not You're fully, just not explaining but, it. You're just like, hey, bud, don't get mad. Next time. You'll get them next time. Right. You it's know, like, just say that. that. Doesn't do any, <laughs> yeah, so just explain yeah. it. Like, break it down. Say, okay. So you lost getting changed. Like, I can appreciate that. I mean, you thought it was a race, right? So what are you gonna, how are you going to do better next time? Oh, I'll get my clothes laid out before. Perfect. Try that. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or time them. Yeah. yeah. Or- like, look, hey, you lost. Like, I got ready first. You lost. But you were two seconds faster than you were yesterday. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, or so show him how to lose. competition against himself. Yeah. And show him how to lose. Like yeah, you compete true. with him and how do you, what point. do you do when you lose? You know, you go, Oh man, you got me next time though. Next time I'm going to get you, you yeah, know, that's and, a good and point. just look for opportunities to lose and show him how that looks or how that should look. I was thinking about that with uh, competing in jujitsu just yeah. recently. I'm like, oh, I should go compete. Like I've never had a really desire to compete, but I'm like, I should go compete. And then my next thought was like, well, what if my family watches my, watches, sees me lose? I'm like, that's actually better than me winning for them. Yeah. It would be yeah. better for them to see me lose, like for my boys to see me get my ass kicked and then get up and then do it again. That would be better than me, them seeing me dominate everybody. Yeah. Just not good for the ego is all. Totally. <laughs> it's selfish. That's all it is. That's all it ever yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. I've had moments of, you know, I think first few competitions, like Kiave like was crying <laughs> I when, I get my, yeah. when I get my butt kicked. I was like, oh, but, but again, that's yeah. good for him. Cause then he sees you, he sees you get choked out and you're like, okay, yeah. you tap and then you get up and then, you know, five minutes or half an hour later, you go back on the mat and you do it again. And he's like, what? My mind, yeah. my, my worldview has just been shattered. Like he just got his ass handed to him and like, dad's going to do it again. This is crazy. But back for more. Yeah. 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 Totally. It's good for him. All right. This is a quick question. Uh, Let's take David this one as the last one, Kip. All right. David Osbernson, as a father, is it good to teach your kids about discipline equals freedom? Yes. Let's wrap it up. Maybe. Maybe said better. Uh, how? <laughs> What's maybe a strategy of teaching them discipline equals freedom? Uh, I, you know, I, the phrase is a really interesting one because if you think about discipline, it's it's self impl- it's self imposed. Yeah. Like somebody can't exert discipline on you. 
by its nature, discipline is something you have to exert upon yourself. But nobody else can, like, they can force you to get out of bed. They can force you or coerce you or manipulate to do things. But then that's not discipline. That's not discipline, yeah. That's something entirely different. Discipline is self-imposed. And by its very nature, it's restrictive. I'm going to get out of bed and I'm going to restrict the amount of sleep that I'm going to get. I'm going to restrict potentially even my immediate health because I'm going to go run or I'm going to do these things that put me in pain and make me suffer. Like by its very nature, discipline is restrictive and it's painful and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. So how is it then that it can lead to freedom? It doesn't actually lead to universal freedom. It leads to the kind of freedom that you're after. It's kind of like the adage, you can have anything you want. You just can't have everything. Like if you want to be lean and fit, if that's what you want, you can have that, but you can't have all the pizza. So that's the discipline equals freedom. So the freedom isn't universal freedom. It's freedom that you've defined. I want to be free, for example, with my health and I want to be lean and I want to be strong and I want to feel good about myself and I want to be capable and I want to be able to do things. And so I'm willing to give up a little bit of sleep, a little bit of satisfaction as I eat food that isn't going to be conducive towards me achieving those objectives. So I think there's some nuance in the phrase discipline equals freedom that you're going to need to explain to your children is it's not universal bliss. It's not universal freedom. So figure out what do your kids want? Like Brecken, he's really into this bodybuilding thing right now. He's been watching oh, videos. Really? Yeah, he loves it. He's been watching videos and like he even does poses. He's like, check out this pose and do this. And then at, last night he came to me and he's like, hey, dad, do I, do I look good? I said, you know, you've lost some weight, but you got some room to go. Because I don't lie to my kids. Like, I'm not going to say, yes, you look good. Like, you, you're dialed in. You're perfect. No, I'm going to be like, yeah, you've lost a little weight. You've done well. But you have room for improvement. And, uh, and so I said, but look, if this is what you want, I think it's a worthy goal. What are you willing to trade for it? And yeah. he's like, what What's do you mean? What's the price? And I yeah. said, you got to. Yeah, exactly. That's what I said. I said, you got to pay for it. He's like, what do you mean pay for it? And I said, well, I'm not talking about money. But you do have to pay for that because he's big into Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm like, Arnold Schwarzenegger had to sacrifice. Left his homeland. He, he was hours in the gym. And you can have that if you're willing to pay the price that he did. And if you're not, that's okay. Be truthful about it. But if you really want what he has, then you need to pay what he paid. And so we've talked a lot about that and I encourage it and I foster it. We're working on a 90 day battle planner for kids. Actually, mm -hmm. I don't know if I told you about that. Yep. yep. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and he's been doing it every day, every single day because he has that plan in front of him. So that's something to look out for, but just have these discussions about paying the price. Yeah. Discipline equals freedom, not unequivocal, not universal freedom, freedom for the thing that you actually want. Yeah. And, and a good lesson for us, I mean, we've had this conversation before, is like when we set up goals and plans for ourselves, like we need to ask ourselves, what am I willing to do? And mm -hmm. what am I willing not to do to yes. accomplish this? And if, you're, if that's not clear, you're wasting your time. You know, it's, it's the, the best analogy of this, I think, is everyone wants to be rich, right? Ah, uh, I want to be a millionaire. Everyone will all probably all say yes to that. Yes, I want to be a millionaire. But the question they should be asking is, am I willing to do the work to become one? And that's where most of us then say, no, I am not willing. And that's okay. I actually think, right. I actually think most people don't say that. Hmm. I think most people say, yes, I'm willing to do the work. And then they bullshit themselves through it. Yeah. And then they wonder why they're not seeing the results. Yeah. Because they're actually yeah. not doing the work. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But what they're you're not, saying is they're true. not truthful with themselves yes. of what they're willing or not willing to do. Yeah. And you need to be truthful. Like I used to think when I started podcasting, I'm like, oh, I want to be like Joe Rogan. I want to have a podcast like Joe Rogan. And there's elements of it that I, I really admire about what he's created. But I'm like, N now, because I'm more mature about this, I'm like, I'm not willing to pay that price. Yeah. And I'm totally yeah. okay with that. I'm okay with that. Yeah. And that opens up some capacity in your mind as well 
when you're clear on what you're willing and we're not willing to do. Otherwise, if you just held on to this expectation of like, oh, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan, but you're not clear on what you're willing and not willing to do, then you're upset with yourself. Man, we're not getting there. Right. You're, it, you're just wasting cycles of energy and contentment and everything else because you want something, but you never clearly identified if you're willing to actually do the work to get there. Right. It's yeah. just, it's such a liberate, truth is such a liberating way to operate your life. And so what people say all the time is like, oh, I can't do that. No, you can. That's the thing. You can do it, but you're consciously deciding not to do it, which is fine. Yeah. It's fine if that aligns with what you're after. But don't BS yourself. Just tell yourself the truth. I'm not willing to do that. You know, people ask me all the time, okay, hey, will you do a podcast this weekend? No. Hey, I appreciate that you're asking me if you can make it work from Monday through Friday, nine to five Eastern, I'm all on. All right, let's do it. Oh, I only do it on the weekends or I can, I, I've got a full-time job, so I can only do it on the weekends. Well, when you're ready to do it the weekdays, then I'll do it with you because I'm not willing to do it on the weekends because I have other priorities that I have identified as being important and I'm going to stick to those things. Yeah. So love it. Be truthful. Be truthful. All right, guys. Submit your questions for future AMAs um, on Facebook, facebook.com slash group slash order of man. To learn more about the Iron Council, we talk about it obviously from time to time. You can go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. We have two main, <laughs> main events uh, coming up later this year. September 3rd through the 6th is our legacy event. That's a, a boy 18 to, or 8 to 15 years old and father could be nephews. But obviously, kind of in general speaking, generally speaking, a father and son event um, in Maine. To learn more about Legacy, go to orderofman.com slash legacy. And then we have our Order of Man main event uh, in Maine, the state Maine, October 9th through the 11th. To learn more about that, go to orderofman.com slash main event. And of course, to support this podcast and this movement, uh, you got to share the share the message and you can do that. Yeah. You got it. You, you can do that a number of different ways, whether it's podcast links, YouTube, Facebook, uh, following Mr. Mickler on Instagram or Twitter or representing with swag, uh, by going to the store.orderofman.com and and getting t-shirts and hats and whatnot. So that's how you support. Do it, do it. All right, guys. Hope that helped. Um, we got a special, Ask me anything guest next next week. Brian Mitchler, my alter ego is Brian. Brian Mitchler. Brian Mitchler <laughs> is going to be joining you, Kip. So it could be interesting. We'll see how that yep. goes. We've got some Super good Super excited to talk with us. that dude. Yeah. Did you just assume his gender? <laughs> That's inappropriate. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, appreciate you. Hopefully this uh, gave you some insight and some feedback and some things that'll help. Uh, appreciate you just as I know, Kip, you do as well. Um, man, it's just good to so be in the true. battle together. We need more people in this, more engaged men in this fight. You know, we talk about the silent majority. Like, we can't be silent. We, the majority part is good, but we just can't be silent anymore. We got to yeah. share it. We got to put the word out. And that's what we're doing here. We've been doing that for over five years and we're just asking you to do it. So stop being yeah. silent about it. If you, if you have, look, if you have truth, you have information, you have things, perspective that would help another individual, then frankly, you have a moral obligation to share it. And some of us haven't been as vocal as we could have been. And we're experiencing the negative ramifications of that. So be vocal. If you, if you, if you find value in what we're doing here and you think other people would be served by it, then share it. Stop being okay. silent. All right, just share it. Stop being greedy and selfish. If you have information, and I don't care, I'm not even talking about this podcast. I'm talking about this podcast and anything else that serves you well, whether it's a book or a podcast or a connection or a resource or what skill set, don't be greedy. Share it. That's what we do as men. We produce. So go produce by sharing value with other people. All right, guys, we'll be back, uh, let's see, tomorrow for another interview. But until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.